This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. Thank you. Uh, I, I just can't with this. I mean, I heard it was bad, but I thought I could handle it. After all, that's what I do, but... Well, we might as well get on with this. Our next offender... The Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure. This notorious below-the-bottom-of-the-barrel kitty movie owes its existence primarily to marketing executive Ken, yes, I spell my name with two N's, Weiselman. And the fact that a marketing executive was the main creative force here says a great deal. Weiselman's main claim to fame is bringing Thomas the Tank Engine and the Teletubbies to American audiences, and he wanted to do a feature film with the latter but was turned down by the creators. So he snapped up some characters from a forgotten edutainment series called My Bedbugs, rebranded them, built what can charitably be called a movie around them, and then proceeded to promote the living here out of it. Surprisingly, seeing these nightmare creatures staring down from the Times Square Toys R Us did not inspire enthusiasm in the public, and Oogie Loves had the worst wide-release opening weekend ever, falling well under previous record holder Delgo's half-million mark. Even then, Weiselman refused to admit defeat, declaring that the bad press would Streisand affect the movie to success. It didn't, obviously, and so now I must examine the case of Oogie Loves, and you're all going to suffer along with me. Welcome to our movie. I'm Oogie. Uh, is this where we get the trend of actors doing that thing where they thank us for watching their movie before the movie starts? I already hate it for that. The Oogie Loves are a trio of Crayola-colored monstrosities consisting of Gooby, the glasses-wearing science nerd, Zuzi, token girl and polyglot who talks to animals, and Toofy, who looks like the kind of kid who would spend most of his time stealing lunch money from Gooby and Zuzi. And Lord of Darkness help me, they also form a band. This is the most amazing movie ever! The movie hasn't even really started yet, but Already it's talking down to what it assumes is its target demographics level, and that's never a good sign. The gold standards of children's entertainment, like Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, were developed by people who worked hard to understand how kids perceive and respond to the world. They didn't treat the audience like adults, because they're not, but they approached things at a level that kids could grasp without condescending or making everything too sugary or dumbed down. This is a movie that assumes it knows what kids like, but anyone old enough to respond to its audience participation gimmick will be old enough to realize they're being treated like idiots and resent it. So yeah, the audience participation thing, we'll talk more about that later, but for now we'll just stick with the basics as presented in the prologue. Butterflies flying across the screen mean it's time to get up and dance, turtles mean it's time to sit down. This method is tested, along with my patience, via sin number two, the Oogie Loves theme song. Yes, yes. Voice actors can barely carry a tune, which is okay because there's hardly any tune to speak of, and the lyrics are equally monotonous. It's like a show at a bad theme park, and I mean a really, really bad one. The kind where none of the rides have been repainted in over a decade and is decorated with sad art of public domain characters. At last, the intro ends. Yes, we're two sins in and we haven't even gotten to the titles. Strap in, kids. And we get a Middle Earth-style flyover to find the Oogies asleep in bed in a little cottage where they seem to live unsupervised. Gah! I take that back, they're obviously being supervised by the creepy Big Brother face in their window! This is Windy Window, one of the non-Oogie members of the household, along with Ruffy, a goldfish who's kind of like Oscar the Grouch but without the charm, and Shloofy, a pillow who sleeps through most of the movie. Lucky Shloofy. It happens to be Shloofy's birthday today, and the Oogies are planning a surprise party and want to know the status on the present they've gotten him. My magical window will show you whatever it is y'all want to see. And all for the tiny cost of your soul. A little invocation chant activates Windy's surveillance powers, where we see a vacuum cleaner named J. Edgar, get it, rolling down the street toting five gold balloons. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so apparently getting stopped by a peacock crossing guard so he wouldn't run over some mice caused J. Edgar to somehow lose control of his motor functions and lose the balloons. How can a movie this inane be this confusing? J. Edgar is distraught over losing Schloofy's present, but the Oogies comfort him. After all, they can just get more balloons, right? They were the last five magical balloons in all of lovely Loveville. I saw the boss fall like a flash of lightning from the heavens. I have witnessed the rise and fall of civilizations. I have sat in judgment over terrible musicals for nearly 12 years, and I can say with confidence that that is the stupidest line an actor has ever been forced to utter. Also, lovely Loveville? Come on, that's the kind of dopey name you'd find in a parody of saccharine kitty fodder like this. You weren't really even trying, were you? The Oogies decide to set out to retrieve the balloons, persuading J. Edgar to stay behind and monitor the situation via Wendy's window. J. Edgar doesn't need much persuasion to do this, as he's clearly dying for a chance to find out if Wendy's curtains match the carpet. Tasteless comments are the only things keeping me sane right now. But first, we get to watch the Oogies change clothes via Umbilicus and set up a stupid running gag involving Toofy's pants falling down, and they need to have breakfast so they can sing a song about flapjacks, and seriously, we're not even 15 minutes in yet, and this movie is lucky its audiences were so small, because it was really testing their attention spans. Finally, the Oogies, and Ruffy for some reason, embark on their mission. Wendy's diabolical magic has shown them the first balloon is in a tall tree. Also in this tree is a teapot treehouse, which is the residence of a pseudo-Valley Girl jargon-spouting gal named Jubilee Rounder. Toofy! What a totally square name! See, when I she like says Jubilee square, Rounder, she actually means cool like because she... Rounder. Oh, you this get the picture. Me. Jubilee takes the Oogies up into the treehouse and introduces them to her grandmother, Dottie Rounder, and you can probably guess what her whole deal is. Oh, circus! Circus! Oh, circles! How I love circles! While Cloris Leachman tries desperately to maintain her dignity, let's take a moment to discuss the Oogie Loves and how unappealing they are. Basically, the Oogies are full-body costume characters, what Disney theme park lingo refers to as fur characters, as opposed to face characters like the princesses who don't use full head masks. This is a type of character that relies very heavily on body language, and the Oogies don't use it very well. They spend a lot of time standing around, bouncing on their heels, and occasionally making half-hearted arm movements. They also have some articulation in the masks, but that just makes everything worse, with barely moving lips and uncanny valley eye movements that would freak out Freddy Fazbear. Top it off with their shrill, overly precious voices, and you don't want to spend five minutes with them, let alone an entire movie. One song and dance later, the songs and dances literally have no other purpose other than as a dance break for the theoretical audience, the Oogies ask for help getting their balloon back. Dottie and Jubilee explain nobody has climbed up their tree before, but Toofy is apparently good at that sort of thing, and sure enough, he gets the balloon with little trouble. Just hold on to my string. Ugh! Does absolutely everything in this nightmare realm have a face? I'm getting serious enchanted Christmas flashbacks. Zuzi and Gooby don't believe Toofy when he tells them the balloon talked, because you know a talking window and a talking fish and a talking vacuum cleaner are normal, but that's just plain crazy. Jubilee gives them a present to give to Shloofy, and they're off to find the next balloon. Well, sort of, because of sin number five the unbearable amount of repetitive bits. See, first we have to watch the Oogie Love's official celebratory cheer. Sing Oogie Love, Oogie Love, Oogie Love, Oogie Love, Oogie Love. Then J. Edgar has to do the Windy Window incantation. One, two, one, two, three. Windy Window, what do you see? And then he has another incantation to activate the walkie-talkie he uses to contact Gooby. Testing, testing, wham, bam, pow. Gooby love, can you hear me now? Yes, repetition is a staple in a lot of kids' media, but these are the sort of things that you expect to see once an episode in a television series. Doing them over and over again in a movie drags the whole thing out. We haven't even reached the half-hour mark, and it already feels like forever. 
But eventually we get back to what amounts to the plot, with the second balloon being located at Milky Marvin's Milkshake Manor. It's in the hands, well, hooves, of a cat eye glasses wearing cow named Mula, who tells them they'll have to take it up with Milky Marvin himself. Played by Chaz Palminetri as our next needed to get his minimum hours in to keep the SAG Health Plan guest star. Oh, not so fast, Daddy O's. Milky Marvin is offering the balloon as the grand prize for his milkshake drinking contest, so the Oogies demand to be allowed to compete. But Marvin refuses to allow it, unless they do a little sing-along. You all want milkshakes? Yes, sir! Then moo! Moo with me. So yeah, it goes on like that for a bit, and there are movie posters with cow wordplay. I refuse to cave to the obvious pun there along with overly cheerful dance extras and dishwashing raccoons for some reason. The contest begins, and Ruffy wins it, becoming even more disturbing in the process. <laughs> Ruffy! Oh, sorry. Milky Marvin gives them a birthday milkshake for Schloofy. Man, that pillow is making out like a bandit today. And after the usual routine, we're off to our next painful cameo-slash-musical number, which takes place at an airport. You mean there's a way out of this miserable here dimension and nobody's taking it? The next balloon is in the hands of Tony Braxton as the egotistical, flower-obsessed, and allergy-prone prima donna Rosalie Rosebud. She's determined to take it on her world tour, but can't resist an opportunity to show off her pipes. Sing? Did somebody say? Sing? But she needs a band to do it, and fortunately, these goofy Technicolor toddlers are well-versed in slow jam R&B. And now, a stirring torch song tribute to Hay Fever. They gotta cough, 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 and go at you. So fun, for certain values of fun fact, Toni Braxton really did have a cold when they filmed this, and her voice had to be modulated up in post-production. I'm not sure if that's why the lip sync is off, or if nobody involved with this cared, but it looks awful. And while we're at it, can we talk about how stupidly low stakes this whole mess is? Rosalie wanting to keep the balloon for herself is the closest thing we've had to a conflict, but one song later she decides she's fabulous enough without it and gives it up. Weiselman seemed to think this utter lack of negativity was in the movie's favor, declaring Pixar always has the triumph of good over evil, but why does there have to be evil in the first place? Because kids don't live in a candy-colored bubble like your characters, Ken. They live in a world where evil exists, along with common everyday struggles, conflicts with friends and siblings, fears and anxieties over certain situations, coping with anger and sadness and disappointment. Stories are one of the ways they learn to deal with these situations and develop the tools they'll need to interact with a world that won't always be sunshine and lollipops for them. And the fact that you think that's a bad thing shows just how little you understand or appreciate those you want to entertain. Rosalie accidentally sneezes the balloon up onto the tail of her plane, but Gooby comes up with an improvised trampoline and retrieves it. Oogie love cheer, Rosalie gives them a bouquet for Schloofy, another round of incantations, and we're off to find the fourth balloon at a truck stop, which is pretty high on the list of places I don't think kids this age should go around unsupervised. Squawk, squawk, squawk. What did she say? This is Penelope. Her bunions are bothering her, and she's gassy. Great. Thanks. I'm so glad I know that. Penelope is the pet of the owner of the truck where the balloon is tangled up, a fellow by the name of Bobby Wobbly. Oh, my sweet Wesley, what have they done to you? He looks like that hit from Count Rugen did permanent damage. Since we have the star of one of the greatest cult classics of all time here, we're going to take a moment to discuss the problems with the basic premise of this movie. Weiselman apparently was inspired to do an audience participation kids movie after seeing Medea goes to jail in the theater and hearing audience members shout out advice to the characters on screen. He really thought he had hit on something new and original, claiming that the idea of interactivity isn't new, but the idea of interactivity in the theater is which 
just isn't the case. He already admitted that he was inspired by seeing what context leads me to believe is a predominantly black audience doing the exact same thing. He doesn't get to Elvis Presley his way into claiming the concept for his own. And it's not like the Medea audience invented it either. The Rocky Horror Picture Show has thrived on interactive screenings for decades, inspiring similar events for films ranging from so bad it's good schlock like The Room to beloved pop culture icons like The Princess Bride. And those performances are a throwback to an earlier tradition of theater, when audiences at the Globe would shout advice to Hamlet and Petruchio, and which we can still see today in things like British pantomimes. What all these examples have that Oogie Loves does not is that the participation is more or less organic. The audience doesn't have to be convinced to play along, they do it naturally. That's not something you can force, and when you try, it's just sad. Bobby isn't about to let a bunch of kids climb all over his semi, but he does invite them into his bubble truck. I've seen Stranger Danger videos that start like this. He also demonstrates the benefits of wobbling with the Oogies in a song that has way too many fanny slaps for this age group. Wobble, wobble, all around and give your tush a pat. It's Zuzi's turn to pretend to do something as she needs to ask Penelope to fly up and get the balloon. This is a problem as Penelope hasn't flown in a long time due to a list of ailments that sounds like the side effects disclaimer in a prescription drug ad. But hey, it's nothing a little ableist you just need to try hard enough encouragement can't fix. Perfect landing, Penelope! With the fourth balloon and a bubble machine in tow, we are finally nearing the end of this quest. The final balloon is caught on the sail of a windmill, which means we're 80% on the main obstacle being a very tall thing. Unfortunately, a rules lawyer llama that would be a good name for a band, forbids them from biking or even running across the grass to the windmill, so naturally the only way they can get there is via a giant flying sombrero. You heard me. Good afternoon, my colorful friends. We are Lola and Lero Sombrero. There may have been a time when a pair of white actors in flamenco costume, one of whom speaks in an exaggerated Spanish accent and the other who communicates primarily by bongo drum, riding around in a flying giant sombrero might have been acceptable in children's or indeed any entertainment, but I'm pretty sure it went out with the Frito Bandito. This is Lola and Lero Sombrero, and they offer the Oogies a lift in their Cancun souvenir shop, I mean Traveling Sombrero, which is powered by the magic of dance. So we get another dance number that at least has some thin motivation for a change, while Ruffy is put on navigation duty. Will this day never end? I feel you, Ruffy. I really do. And if you ever wanted to see a bunch of overgrown four-year-olds doing sensual flamenco moves, well, first, what the here is wrong with you, but second, this scene is right up your alley. After some undercranked dancing, they reach the windmill, but apparently flying the sombrero up to get the stupid balloon isn't an option. What is an option is growing a giant tulip out of the ground so they can all climb on it and hold Ruffy out to grab the balloon while demanding the audience shout encouraging words to him. You can do it, you can do it Ruffy. You think I can? I know you can. I'm going for it. So now, with all five balloons in tow and Shloofy about to wake from his coma, the end is finally in- Oh, sweet Lucifer, it's starting over! What can we do? We have to bring you home! There's only one force stronger than the wind. <sighs> Who's been screwing with this thing? The Oogies encourage the audience to help them blow kisses to the balloons to convince them to return. It's like the scene where Tinkerbell is brought back to life. If Tinkerbell had been poisoned in the first act and forced everyone to spend an hour going on all sorts of insane quests before revealing that what she really needed was a good round of applause, and this one simple thing could have spared everyone a whole lot of trouble, and sweet Lucifer, I hate this movie so fucking much! The balloons come back, and Shloofy is brought out for his surprise party, and since Shloofy has the apparent mental capacity of a six-month-old, you kind of have to wonder why they went to all this effort. Everyone is there, including the assorted stuffed animals slash puppets, Wendy has put on some festive ivy for the occasion, and we find out what the balloons do that is so magical. 
an a cappella routine. Honestly, I think they'd have been better off getting a cameo video from Pentatonix. Speaking of cameo videos, Wendy has some from all the guest stars because apparently Shloofy's birthday is the lovely love villa equivalent of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And finally, mercifully, we have one last song and dance. No. No, I did not. I almost have to hand it to Oogie Loves. It's not easy to insult the intelligence of an age group that is still working on the finer points of the alphabet and toilet habits, but this movie does it. Along with insulting the intelligence of their parents, the cast, everyone who works hard to make genuinely good children's entertainment, and pretty much the entire human race. And the sad thing is, Ken Weiselman doesn't seem to have gotten anything from the experience. He's still out there, making money off of overseas kid shows and proudly touting this so-called innovative interactive film. If I punish him, would he learn his lesson? Do any of us ever learn our lessons?